about what you do in your role. Okay. Um, hi, my name's Steve Farr. I uh, work for TIBCO, uh, particularly in the Spotfire division, which is all about uh, data analytics. Some people call it data discovery. Um, my particular responsibilities are for the oil and gas sector, uh, both upstream and downstream, and indeed service partners, um, as one of our key verticals uh, across the world. Instead of starting with um, the most important bits of, I'll ask you secondly what the most important things, issues in data management are at the moment. Mm -hmm. First of all, and it's something that I guess people haven't been using for, for that long to refer to these fields, but can you give us an idea of what the smart field or the digital oil field actually means? Okay, so what is the smart field, the digital oil field all about? I think that if you look at other industries, um, they have been producing a lot of digital information from their operational uh, systems and machines for quite some time. It's been called, for example, shop floor data capture. That's been around for 30 years or so. The idea that these particular devices will produce digital fields, uh, digital, sorry, the idea that these devices will produce digital feeds starts to open up some big issues and some opportunities. All of a sudden we have a lot of data coming from the wellhead that we never had before and we can start to think about how we might use that in innovative ways to spot trends, to work out uh, if there are some particular problems when we compare that data with other more traditional data sources um, from finance, from HR and so on and so forth. What are the biggest issues with regards to data management in the oil and gas industry at the moment? So if we look at the big issues to deal to do with uh, oil and gas data at the moment and data management, the, the first would have to be volume. All of a sudden we have what people like to call big data. And big data is affecting lots of industries. It's affecting uh, retail as people go online. It's affecting uh, pharmaceuticals as people try to uh, find out more and more detail about the effect of drugs. Well, we have the same issue in oil and gas. All of a sudden, we have all of this data coming from the field. Geophysical, geochemical, production data. How do we bring it all together in a meaningful way? And how do we just handle the volumes? So what we have to bring to uh, the big data issue is understanding. So that's, that's the next issue. All of us, when we're trying to spot trends, so we might be, for example, wanting to work out EUR and decline curves. If we want to do those things, we're really looking for a needle in a haystack. The haystack just got a whole lot bigger. But we have more ways of getting at the data. We have more points which will point to the truth. Whereas we only had uh, a guy with a clipboard, maybe an Excel spreadsheet, looking at production at the end of the day, comparing that to some of, the, uh, uh, some, of, some of the pressures on the rig, those sorts of things. Now we have everything. We need, therefore, a joined up uh, enterprise scale way of handling all of that data. And Excel spreadsheets aren't going to cut it anymore. With regards to, this has been a, it's been a rev the big data has been a revolution. I know it's, it's a bandit, often often banded about turn up. But big data has revolutionized the way that things go. Do you think the oil and gas industry has kept up with other industries with regards to um, with regards to hand with regards to data management full stop? So has the oil and gas industry kept up with other industries with, with regard to data management and, and big data? I think there has been a level of um, conservatism within the oil and gas industry. Um, and I think that the role of the expert in the oil and gas industry has always been paramount. We've always really relied on those people, their expertise, their interpretation of what's happening in the field, what's happening in the basin. Um, I think though that as we come to the uh, second part of this decade, we're going to start to see that oil and gas uh, organizations are going to institutionalize the way they handle all of this big data, these new data fields that are coming through, because they just won't have the skills to interpret them in a more uh, off-the-cuff manner. 
And in any case, when we look at some of the other issues around quality, around the environment, we probably don't want to be there anyway. So I think the oil and gas industry in this respect is going to change quite quickly uh, over the next few years. You mentioned skills. Mm -hmm. 2015 is, the, is kind of the terminal date of the, of the great skill shortage that's, I mean, that people have been talking about for the last 30, 30 years. Mm -hmm. how, is this, how is the onset of the, of the great crew change going to affect data management? So let's look at the, the great crew change, the, the 2015 um, cutoff uh, in terms of experience. One of the things that we're going to have to do is to make better use of the people who remain. So we might lose 80%, 90%, who knows, it might be 95% of that experience. For those that are left, we have to make better use of them. And that means that wherever they sit in the world, we bring the data to them. They can't be in every single field, in every single play, all of the time. So the idea of remote working and collaboration becomes very, very important. I think secondly, we need to look at our systems in terms of analyzing uh, the present and analyzing the future, not just the past. If we looked at data analysis um, up until now, it has all been about looking at things that happened in the past and trying to make sense of them. Modern systems can actually feed data in real time now and can look at events that happen in the present and through what's called predictive analytics can tell another system or a person to make a change. So put some more uh, water down, for example, in the blink of an eye. That might be a decision that's made. You don't actually need to uh, go away and bring up a lot of historic data the knowledge is already there. And also we need to take that into the future as well. We can use analysis of historic events and what's happening in the present to predict with a good deal of accuracy now what will happen in the future. And this is the idea that we bring statisticians and statistical techniques into the way that we actually run our plant, our machinery in the field. You mentioned um, looking into looking into the past as being one of the really the main way that, that people surmised what might happen next for, for quite for quite a long time. Mm. Um, obviously, real time data capture real, means real time production optimization. That's something that's fairly new. Um, there was someone I think a guy Jim Crompton from Chevron told me that today's um, what do you say? He said. Um, Today's production data is tomorrow's legacy data. Legacy data is one of those is kind of the albatross around around people's necks with regards to the fact that you know you might have an offshore installation or an onshore installation somewhere in the Middle East which has had forty years worth mm -hmm. of data um, on printed on printed sheets. Um, maybe if you just explain what legacy data is. And how, and how, uh, with regard, how the industry is going to is dealing with it, and we'll have to deal with that going forward. Okay. So, 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 what is legacy data in the oil and gas industry, and, and, and how do we see dealing with that legacy data in the future? Obviously, the oil and gas industry has been around an awful long time, and there is an awful lot of data out there. And certainly, I've seen people visualizing data in our tool, Spotfire, going back to the 1920s on fields that are still operational today. The question is, is that of any use? And I would argue that it is. Um, I think that one of the key considerations as we lose skills and experience and people out of the crew coming up to 2015 is that we have to be able to institutionalize the knowledge that is in all that historic data. And how do particular reservoirs react to certain techniques over time given the geochemical composition in the area. These learnings can actually be put into data, can actually become part of a statistical model that will help you the next time you have a play in that area or a difficult play of a certain type 
with a certain set of uh, with a certain chemical footprint, for example. This is absolutely vital because you won't have the experienced hand on, on uh, there in the field anymore to say, ah, this is how we deal with one of these. So that it, that legacy data, we all like to live in the in the present and in the future. It is absolutely vital, and we must capture it, and we must capture it now. It will be lost forever. What is data visualization? So what is data visualization? Data visualization is finding the best possible way to help humans understand trends. There are a great number of ways of visualizing data. We have <coughs> uh, bar charts and histograms and scatter plots heat maps, um, and, and we can also overlay data onto graphical images. So we might want to take a, uh, a graphical image, for example, of a, uh, the, the surface of a, uh, a particular basin, or we might want to um, look at uh, the, um, the substrata and a visualization of that, and we can start to lay data on t onto that as well. But the most important thing is that the data is presented in a way that the human understands it. And, and that's where a lot of the knowledge comes in from organizations like mine and others. What's the best way of presenting this particular piece of data? We can all go into Excel or our spreadsheet tools and pick a graph type. But is that the right graph type? A lot, a lot of work has gone into, actually, what is the best way of visualizing that particular type of data? what's happening with regards to the data explosion now. If you go 10 years forward from where we are now, where do you, where do you, think, things will, where do you think things will go? Get, I mean, I'm, given that there's such an emphasis on production optimization now as well, because mm. the age of heavy oil is, uh, sorry, the age of, of easy oil is coming to an end, do you see, you know, a lot of data managers can't even get their feet around the table. With regards to how they're, with regards to how they're treated in companies, they're, a lot of the times it seems that they're treated more or less like an IT contractor rather yeah, than no. an integral part. I mean, that's a bad, it's a bad uh, way to say it, but I've heard you know yeah. people from Chevron, Saudi Aramco say that. Going forward in ten in ten years, where is data management and where is the data manager? So going forward in ten years, where is data management? Where is the data manager? Um, it's my personal belief that they are helping the oil and gas company become a scientific company. What do I mean by a scientific company? We have, since the days of um, Michael Porter, had this aspiration to run our organization scientifically and on a scientific basis, rather than predictions by wetting your finger and placing it in the air, if you like. A lot of uh, business decisions are made on the cuff, on the fly, through my experience. We don't necessarily have the luxury to do that anymore. Firstly, because there's too much data around. Um, secondly, because mistakes are uh, far too important now. The risk, regulatory risk, environmental risk, especially in this industry, are so great, the, the implications are so great for an organization um, that, that simply taking a guess isn't a correct decision for an organization at any level. So the organization and the management of data in real time and through using predictive statistics to help decision making becomes the way that organizations run. And it's not just oil and gas organizations, it's all organizations will hopefully run that way and become scientific organizations that make the right decisions more often than they make the wrong decisions. So that's where I see data an analysts in the future. Uh, when I was working in a large oil and gas producer 10 years ago, the data analysts were trying to get their head around um, the difference between product and packed product. 
and how do we uh, how do we work out the profit and the margin on each? They've got some bigger, uh, much more exciting things to work out now, and it's up to organisations like mine to bring them the right tools to help them do that. It's interesting you say that because one of the things that I've got from the geologists that I've been speaking to, I spoke to the head of energy of the British Geological Survey, I spoke to the head of the petroleum group, um, the geology section of the petroleum group. He said that one of the reasons that people um, are not getting into those careers is because they're not because the oil industry is seen as more commercial than scientific. And people who become geologists and people who become biostratigraphers and all of this jazz want to be scientists. Do you think that that's, when you talk about oil and gas companies as scientific organizations, do you think you're going to be getting a people who are scientists, for the love of it, going to be more interested in joining oil and gas companies? So are, are people who are scientists going to be more interested in jo joining oil and gas companies? I think ultimately the market will decide. Um, let, me, let me give you an example. Recently, uh, one of our uh, large telco providers in the UK, a large mobile phone provider, found that they had a huge lack in terms of trained statisticians. And so they embarked upon a large recruitment program from the universities of people who were skilled using the R language in statistics and took them through a, a, a very long training process and at the end of three years made them good people for the organization. Uh, a year afterwards they'd virtually all left. They'd gone to work for banks. And, and that's the way that this is going to go. It, it ultimately people will go where there is an economic reward for them to go. In the oil and gas industry there will have to be an economic reward for them to be in that place. Otherwise, we won't be able to do the difficult plays anymore. We won't have the knowledge to get the stuff out of the ground. So that's a decision that will have to rest in the boardroom. One of the things that I got from speaking to some guys at Oil and Gas UK and then people at Energi a couple of people at Energistics as well, mm -hmm. I was talk um, talking to those guys, was that if you wanted to embark on a career as a data manager, there's not really, uh, at an oil and gas company, there isn't really a, um, a kind of stratified career path for you. A lot of people simply end up doing these things. Is, do, you think that's, do you think that's problematic as well? So is the issue that there's, there's, no, uh, there's no stratified career path for a data manager in oil and gas uh, a problem in terms of recruiting? Um, I think it certainly is. When you are there on the ground and you are wanting deep analysis of a particular uh, subject that, you, that is bothering you, those people are the most valuable people you could you want to uh, talk to in your organisation. All of a sudden, you have this fantastic resource that that you can tap into, um, but they are tapped into relatively infrequently. I think that's the way it was in the past. Let me take you back to the idea of this scientific organisation that runs much more like a machine than a group of people chatting to each other in an office. In that organisation, the work that the statisticians do and the data managers do in the background is shared through the software and through the user interface of the software using sophisticated in-house social tools, if you like, Facebook for the organisation, with the people in marketing, the people in trading, um, the people running the refinery, uh, the people organizing the transportation. It's not a separate function. It's not those people down on the third floor, as used to be in, in my case. Um, you know, let's go down and see them. No, they will actually push information to me to help me do my job. And through collaboration, they'll always push the right information to me. You know, I think this is something that the social media sphere and uh, the, the idea of uh, any information anywhere, anytime through mobile devices, through the web, has really provided us an opportunity. So they become much more of the machine. Now, we do still, though, have to appreciate that they are a very important part of the machine. If our machine doesn't work as well as our competitor's machine, I think any business manager will make the right steps to get the right people into their organization, just like those banks and telco providers are, are battling over the great statisticians at the moment. I wonder what the relative 
uh, salary rates are when you compare that with oil and gas. I don't think oil and gas are going to be on the top of the list. Maybe they should be. my experience as well. And another issue that I've come across with regards to basic with the new adoption of technology, we talked a little bit about the conservatism, the innate conservatism. We've also, I think you've got to come up against, with regard, if you have a, an already in, a system that's already in place, you want to upgrade it with something extraneous and completely new, and a bit scary, to be honest with you as well. Um, what do you do? What, what would you say to those people in companies who are at that crossroads of we're either going to have to, it's going to be all one thing or, or all the other, and I, I basically don't know whether state of the art um, is going to be the best thing for them. If you're adopting something midstream, midstream is the wrong word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're adopting something completely afresh and it's going to mean a lot of downtime, it's probably going to mean a lot of teething problems as well. How would you, can, what's the business case for that? So when you're adopting new technologies, it, it can be uh, quite scary. There can be a lot of downtime. Um, and people don't necessarily know what the payback is going to be. I think that the, the way that you assess these um, uh, projects needs to be fairly clearly defined between what the business benefits you're trying to get are and really only take the ones that are quantifiable. I'm going to do things faster, cheaper, smarter is difficult because it's difficult to quantify, it's difficult to put dollars on. And then on the other side, let's look at the IT uh, impact. Is it going to be more expensive or less expensive for the IT department to run this new system. How do those two things then weigh out against each other? The particular inflection points you get tend to be around integration. Um, integration has been described as being a, a thin pipe between two systems uh, that cost more than the two systems put together. Uh, and that quite often is true because we, especially in the oil and gas industry, we are dealing with some very diverse streams of data. We might have the petrol data coming in, we've got our geophysical data, we've got our GIS arc, uh, data coming through. Um, we've also got our finance system, which is probably going to be SAP. And, and we're mashing those things together. That is very, that, that's a big task. So we have to look holistically at the costs in the IT department of running this new system. And you know, frankly, does any oil company anymore, you know, as they did in 99, 2000, have the luxury of a five, six year window to put in a new system? I don't think they do. Those systems are in place. They have to, certainly, to a certain extent be left alone augmented over time, but rip and replace is not, uh, not a smart idea. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to build on top much more fleet of systems, systems that can be deployed much quicker through cloud, through private cloud, and with systems that can be understood by users much, uh, much more quickly, uh, and where users are not bound by very large projects defining IT structures and defining data structures. I think one of the things that I mean, I think I've got in my head anyway, I've gone over the main things that I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about, but we haven't yet touched on um, a bugbear for the oil and gas industry that's not so much of a bugbear for other industries that are taking us on a long way down the line, and that's um, standardization and the collaboration that you talked about as well. Mm -hmm. um, why is, why is standardization important? I mean, in really basic terms, why is standardization important? So why is standardization important? The... Sorry, can I... Maybe yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Maybe it would be best to even just explain yeah. what data standardization means. Okay. And then why it's, and then why it's important. Okay. So, so what is data standardization and why is it important? In a particular industry, 
we'll want to take our key data streams and share the structure, also called the metadata, that surrounds those systems across our industry, although we are competitors. And that sounds scary. It certainly sounded scary to the retail industry 20 years ago when they went through this, but they're pretty much out the other side now. The same would be true of the pharmaceutical industry, and it's particularly in the area of testing, where that has to be shared, not just with uh, the competitors, but also is shared through peer review and is shared with government organisations. There's a lot of sharing of data going on there. There's also sharing between uh, organisations that are not in the same vertical. So if we take in the oil and gas industry, well the oil and gas industry runs an awful lot of stores. And they are packed with products made by the consumer packaged goods industry and they want to share data with you. They, they want to know what's selling best in the stores at what time, when someone also buys fuel or also buys something else. That's really important to them. They want to share with you. So we know that standardization has to happen and what needs to happen to the data in order to make it happen. And over time, industry groups have got together and have agreed standardization principles and we all know what's happened with XML data, uh, for example, as being a major backbone to the standardization um, movement and also for the, for, the, for the physical transportation and sharing of that data and the understanding of that data. So why hasn't it happened in oil and gas, between oil and gas companies? Um, I think because they are uh, large, to a certain extent monolithic, and to a certain extent in the past they could always do what they needed to do themselves. They were among the biggest software companies in the world. You know, in addition to IBM and Microsoft and all of those names that you know, the oil and gas industry was, were, were big writers of software and indeed many software companies have come out of large oil and gas companies. Um, also, in every other aspect um, of the uh, physical operation of the field in particular, they could invent their own wheels. Again, we have to look at whether that's fleet of foot enough, but we also have to take that into the context of a highly regulated industry now. Highly regulated in terms of quality, health, service and environment, also highly regulated financially as well. The sharing of data cannot be avoided, it is time to get together and agree those standards. And eventually we'll be able to share our knowledge and hopefully be more profitable. It doesn't mean losing your competitive edge and I think that's always the thing that's on the, in the back of the mind. And we have to learn from, from industries like, uh, like retail.